Hi, I'm Kurt Bontilan, and I'm here to talk about the neuroscience of cooking and how concepts in psychology and neuroscience relate to and are important for cooking and food in general. I went to Vassar College and I studied neuroscience because I've always been fascinated by how our brains work, and like I'm sure most of us are, I'm obsessed with food. I taught myself how to cook, and I learned a lot of recipes from the various places I grew up, like India, Philippines, and Zimbabwe. And now I have a YouTube cooking channel. I don't think people realize how pervasive psychology and neuroscience are in cooking and food. All five senses are used to perceive food and inherently affect our experience of cooking and eating. We know from basic psychology that sensation and perception play different yet complementary roles in how we interpret the world around us. We sense the environment through touch, taste, sight, sound, and smell, and this information is sent to our brains in raw form as neural impulses. We then perceive these sensations as the brain interprets and makes sense of the world around us. Keeping these roles of sensation and perception in mind, we can try to tackle the question of why people have varying preferences in food, and why the same foods elicit different reactions from different people. On familiar foods to some people, like a vegan burger patty made with organic quinoa, black beans, and crushed flax seeds, which are then boiled in water, or Hyderabadi lamb biryani, which involves raw lamb being cooked under a layer of rice and a slew of spices from cardamom to cilantro to cinnamon. Might sound strange to some people and might turn some people off. And even if they work up the courage to try it, their preconceived notions of what it'll taste like still affects their experience of the food, which suggests that it's not just the food itself, but the concept of it, and that there's more tasting food than the taste buds themselves. Actually, the human tongue is only able to distinguish among five distinct qualities of taste. The nose, on the other hand, is able to distinguish among hundreds of substances, even in very small amounts. It's when you exhale that the olfactory system contributes to flavors, as opposed to the actual smelling that occurs when you inhale. There's a back channel that goes from the mouth to the smell receptors. Vapors rise off the food in our mouths and trigger our sense of smell. If your nose is blocked, the vapors don't get pulled in from your mouth and into your nose. Hence, the nose is very important for taste during the exhale. So even though it feels like the taste is sensed in your mouth, it's actually not. The molecules of food that give rise to the full experience of taste come from your mouth, through the back channel in your nose, and actually sensed in your nose. Pretty cool, right? Now, it's more obvious that the visuals and the smells of food give us information about the food. But even the sound of food can give us information about the temperature of the foods and liquids, like whether it's hot or cold, the freshness, crunchiness, and even fat content. When we think about food, I think most of us would agree that the most important aspect of it is the way it tastes. But when you say something is delicious and that you like the way it tastes, what you're actually saying is that you like the way it smells, looks, sounds, feels, in addition to the way it tastes. And there's a whole industry out there that tries to take advantage of this. Food companies hire flavorists whose job is to make food more appealing and addictive, using what they know about food science and the neuroscience of taste. So not only do they think about the way food looks and tastes, but they also put thought in the way food sounds as well. By making food that appeals to all of your senses, the food becomes more addictive and you crave it. So next time you're at the supermarket, or when you're eating that delicious snack, think about how that food is stimulating all your senses, and how that influences how much you're enjoying it, or whether or not you end up buying more of it. So we've talked about the important role of the olfactory system in the creation of flavor. Now let's switch over to the tongue, which is what we usually think of when we talk about how something tastes. Taste buds contain taste receptors, and when molecules of food and drink substances interact with saliva, they become bound to the taste receptors, which gives rise to the sensation of taste. Taste buds are located in the upper surface of the tongue, as well as other parts of the body, like the esophagus and the intestines. And on a side note, research in mice has revealed that there are receptors in the digestive tract that senses sugars, which then send neural impulses to the brain telling it to eat more of that. If this is true in humans as well, it suggests that maybe we shouldn't always listen to our bodies when it comes to sweets, because our bodies are hardwired to like sweet things, and it'll always tell you to eat more of it. But it makes sense that our brains are hardwired to like sweet things, because the mother's milk is sweet, and so newborn babies will drink it automatically without having to learn that it's good for them. On the other hand, it makes sense that we're hardwired to dislike bitter things, because most substances containing toxins are bitter, so babies will spit them out, which is obviously very useful. 
So let's go back to our initial question of why people have varying preferences in food and why the same foods can elicit different reactions from different people. Some of this may be explained by the taste receptors on the tongue. The number of taste buds on the tongue vary from person to person and people who have more taste buds experience flavors more intensely. So someone who has more taste buds will experience a sweeter sweet than someone who has less taste buds, even if they're tasting the same pecan pie or the same piece of cheesecake. So even with the learned differences in food preferences, there are also inherent biological differences between people that give rise to why some people have a sweet tooth while others have salty or more savory cravings. These taste buds are also surrounded by pain receptors, which means the more taste buds you have, the more pain receptors you have as well. So the same people who experience sweetness more intensely will also experience pungency or spiciness more intensely. This is because the burning or hot sensation experienced when eating spicy food comes about when chemical compounds activate receptors associated with other senses that mediate pain and thermal perception. In Western cuisines, pungency or spiciness is considered a related but distinct sensory experience to taste. It's associated with the physical reactions of heat like vasodilation, sweating, and flushing. What's interesting is that in Indian cuisines and other cuisines with a lot of Chinese and Indian cultural influence where hot and spicy foods are very common, pungency or spiciness is strongly associated with the sense of taste and is even traditionally thought of as a sixth basic taste in addition to sweetness, sourness, saltiness, bitterness, and umami. So technically, flavor is not in the molecules of the food that we eat. These molecules just trigger the sensory receptors that send signals to our brain. Flavor is created in the different pathways in our brain, interpreting signals from the different senses, namely touch, taste, sight, sound, and smell. And subsequently, it's our brains that create cravings for these flavors so that we seek them out and want more of it. And as I said before, it makes sense evolutionarily that our brains crave sweet and fat-dense foods because our brains evolved to help us survive back when food was scarce and starving to death was a real danger. But now that most of us live in a society where there is an abundance of food, the way that our brains are hardwired can lead to all sorts of health problems. And this creates an interesting challenge to the flavorists and food industry people out there, including chefs at restaurants, hospitals, and cafeterias, because they have to create foods and flavors that are delicious, addictive, and appeals to all of our senses. But now, with the pressure of being healthy, organic, and all natural, and with the emerging fight against obesity and chronic diseases, they also need to create foods that have less calories, less sodium, less fat, and less sugar which has them scrambling to find substitutes without sacrificing any of the wonderful flavors we've been talking about. It's a complicated predicament of the modern society we live in. A potential solution that's been proposed is based on one of my favorite applications of neuroscience in the realm of food, and that is flavor transformation. For example, there's a berry called the Miracle Berry, which is a naturally occurring ingredient which contains a glycoprotein called Miraculin. Miraculin has the unique ability of masking taste receptors on your tongue, primarily the sour taste receptors. The result of this is that things that are usually sour or tart taste sweet. The health and economic benefit of this, if applied effectively, is to remove the need for adding sugars or artificial sweeteners in food and beverages so that the end product is all natural and overall healthier to eat and drink. In general, manipulating flavors and foods using naturally occurring ingredients could have huge implications in how we think about raw ingredients, how we prepare and manufacture foods, as well as the environmental impacts and how far food needs to travel to get to us. If we could trick our eyes, taste buds, and our noses to make locally available foods look, taste, and smell like more exotic foods from faraway places that we want and crave, it would essentially eliminate food miles and wasted energy, and may possibly even address the problems of overfishing and the high carbon footprint of meat production. However, it might take some time for these ideas to come to fruition and have large-scale applications, since, for example, the Miracle Berry is highly perishable and expensive. Each berry costs a whopping two US dollars or more. But it's definitely something worth thinking about as we try to exploit what we know about food science and the neuroscience behind taste and flavor in order to improve our health, well-being, and reap the benefits for our environment. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning about some of the neuroscience and psychology behind cooking and food, and continue enjoying the world of flavors out there.